let's just start there. You know, how our collective experience in this country in the pandemic exposed these massive, massive gaping holes in the way we've structured our society um, as it relates to care work. Yeah. So, you know, care, w when we talk about care work, I think it's important to define what it is we're talking about. And so care, I think, is all the labor uh, that allows us to sustain ourselves day to day, allows us to live and thrive as Domestic Workers United, a uh, organization here in New York City said, it's the work that makes all other work possible. The feeding, the nurturing, the assisting and loving human beings. Um, and this was traditionally women's work, although it is now largely in the marketplace. And during the pandemic, I think what we saw is a real um, discrepancy in who was cared for and how they were cared for. So some people's care is privileged over other people's care. So there were there was visible recognition of essential workers and care workers during the pandemic. And I was outside at 7 p.m., like a lot of people in New York City, banging pots and pans as a way to acknowledge and appreciate care workers. So we do talk about the value of this work. But those essential workers didn't always get the pay and the benefits and the protections that they needed. And in fact, their service was very often framed as necessary to care for other people, right? So they were considered important to the degree that they took care of other more privileged people, but their well being was often not mentioned, um, or if it was mentioned, it depended on upon the care work that they provided. Essential work, but what is the essentiality of it, or what, what is so essential of, about it? It's uh, one, you know, we, we, we saw. I believe it was the lieutenant governor of Texas or maybe the attorney general, I forget who, it was the lieutenant governor at the time, at the uh, at the outset, maybe, you know, spring 2020 saying, well, you know, I think grandma and grandpa would be happy to get people back to work and sacrifice themselves if it meant getting the economy back on track. Um, and that just stuck out to me as a real, uh, a, a wonderful example of the priorities of the kind of get back to work crowd at the outset of the pandemic and who bore the brunt of that. I mean, the essential workers ranged from a, 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 a different fields, from medical workers, as you describe, uh, hospital workers to just minimum wage workers do, working at um, McDonald's or, or, or wherever or, or, or DoorDash delivery drivers. Um, but, but care workers in particular, it, it's just this very direct relationship of some people deserve to be cared for and they're the people that can pay for care. And some people, this kind of underclass of largely women, largely women of color, um, are there to be the caregivers for profit. And that's much of what you explore, of course, in your book. That's right. And so... Um we as a society, I think, value care. We talk about the importance of care, but there is a large sector of our population that is not cared for. Since the mid 1990s, we have not had anything like a welfare system in this country. Welfare has been dismantled, has been turned into block grants. And so poor single mothers don't really have an alternative apart from entering the labor market. The jobs that are available for people who are care workers or low wage workers is not enough to raise a family. Um, and so I think that question of how people are able to survive right now is critical. Um, there is the, we have something like 40 million Americans who are living in poverty, right? 1.5 million American households live in what is called extreme poverty, uh, nearly twice as many. And so I think the question we have to ask is what kind of support systems exist uh, that's outside the marketplace that is available for people who are the most marginalized, who are most in need. Many of these care workers who you're talking about don't have guaranteed benefits, don't have health insurance themselves, don't have a system to rely on if for some reason they have to exit the labor market, uh, don't have a way to, uh, to find affordable childcare for their own children or often separated from their children. Many of these are migrant workers who are coming from abroad who have no choice but to leave their children in their home countries. 
Um, and many of them are undocumented, which means that they are also vulnerable to exploitation by their employers and by the state. And so it's a really crucial situation where we have actually not cared for people who are providing essential labor to all of them. If we didn't have child care workers, we wouldn't be able to go to work every day, right? If we didn't have people who were producing the food, we wouldn't be able to feed ourselves every day. So it's really important work and I think needs to be acknowledged and recognized um, in a material way. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it, it reminds me of how in September of last year, Gavin Newsom in California actually vetoed a bill that came through the Democratic legislature in the state that would have allowed housekeepers, uh, nannies, and other uh, workers who work in domestic um, workplaces, they would have had rights under OSHA. This is a Democratic governor who clearly has broader aspirations, um, who vetoed a bill giving domestic workers rights. Um, just your response to that, and I guess we can talk about it in less like an electoral partisanship way and more just about capitalism. Yeah, well, there's a long history of exclusion of domestic workers from the rights of labor. Back in the 1930s, that was a key turning point when most workers in this country got the basic rights that we think of as necessary for people to work in this country. Minimum wage, social security benefits, the right to organize, those are the three pillars of the 1930s New Deal program. Domestic workers were excluded from that, as were agricultural workers, because these were largely non-white occupations, mostly African-Americans who worked in those two occupations. And that long history has carried forward. Domestic workers today do have uh, the right to Social Security and to minimum wage, although we know that that's not enforced in most cases. Um, but they don't have rights to OSHA protections, and they do not have the right to organize and bargain collectively. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to ask ourselves, why is that the case? Why is it that this these workers who we all have acknowledged vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic, how important this work is, and this question of childcare now is a huge one uh, for most Americans. Um, why don't these workers have the basic rights and protections that most other workers in this country have? Well, I think the answer is leverage, right? I mean, it's the same way reason we militarize the border and make it so difficult for for folks to get citizenship. There is a the dirty secret is that the people having less protections or having that point of leverage over them when it comes to their undocumented status, but also their lack of union representation or formal kind of recognition, it allows for more exploitation. Yeah, absolutely. And so the question of organizing and people's ability to organize is really crucial. Um, and domestic workers have begun to organize outside the formal union structure. And I think that's been really important in terms of raising the questions and the issues that are important for this workforce. But I still think we have a long way to go. I, I think there's so much emphasis on, as you said a few minutes ago, about getting people back into the workforce um, that uh, I think there is a sense that we have to do that at all costs, even if it means the exploitation of a certain class of workers. But the other question I, I would raise, Emma, is why don't we have a system where families can take care of their own children? Right. right. Why, why, why is the framework always one of forcing people into the labor market? There are middle class families, there are poor families who actually do want to stay home and take care of their own children. If we value child raising, if we value parenting, we should actually have some kind of child allowance, which is widespread in, in Europe, that allows families to stay home and take care of their children, whether they're poor or middle class or wealthy.